All right, welcome back to New Zero Land. So in the last episode, I sold the DSR, and now I want to talk about the guy I sold it to, and his mission to do the right thing for the planet, and how batteries factor into that. This is the guy I sold Max to. His name is Jez. He really wanted to go electric for a long time, and over the years we'd catch up and chat about different ideas, like buying an electric car for commuting and a gas bike for road trips and riding with friends, or buying a gas car for road trips and the electric motorcycle for commuting. That was the main reason he contacted me, because he saw my videos and he wanted to know more about what it's like to live with a zero, because he was hoping that that might work for him. So we catch up every once in a while and talk about the ideal vehicle scenario, which we're all searching for but doesn't really exist. You know, I've owned like 20 different cars and a handful of bikes because I've been searching for the perfect one, you know? I went into each one with the intention of keeping them forever. But things change, our interests change, life needs change. I guess this is a whole other topic for another time. Anyway, Jez cares about the effect that he's having on the planet. And, you know, he's become a vegan and he wants to do the ethical thing when it comes to vehicles too. So he's been doing as much research as he can into each electric car and the manufacturing process and how that impacts the environment so that he can make the right choice. We all know that the zero emissions marketing of electric vehicles isn't totally true because it takes some pollution to actually make the car. You have to factor in how much CO2 was created when you create the car. And with electric cars, the batteries are the biggest part. My buddy Spencer did a whole awesome write-up on this and I'm totally stealing his graphs, but uh, if you want to read it, I'll link it in the description. Basically, when you look at what it takes to build a gas car versus an electric car, the electric car pollutes twice as much solely because of the battery. And the bigger the battery, the more pollution you make. But even though it polluted more during production, the electric car eventually becomes a better choice because it doesn't create CO2 as you're driving it. But the idea is that once the battery is made, the pollution is over. You took something out of the earth and refined it and turned it into something you can use, but you can use it over and over. You don't just burn the battery every time you do a road trip and then start the whole process over again. But how do you charge that battery? Where does that energy come from? Well, if you have solar panels, it comes from the sun. So like I said, the pollution is over. So yeah, you have that big CO2 emission at the beginning, but that's where it ends. So if we're looking at the gas engines graph, if we're going to be honest about the impact that they make, this graph isn't just tailpipe emissions. How do we get that gas? What about the drilling for oil and transporting it and all the electricity needed to refine it into something we can use? So in reality, the gas car's line should look more like this. This needs to be calculated every time you go to the gas station. For every tank of gas, you're not just polluting a little bit out of your exhaust. There's a whole lot of other stuff happening before that, we just don't see it because the gas is already there, ready to use. It's kind of like eating a burger without having to think about the cow. A whole other topic. But to solve this problem, one does not simply go electric. There are levels. Which electric car creates the least CO2 during production? The batteries are the biggest part, but what about the frames? BMW i3s are apparently the best because it's all carbon fiber and they use recycled materials. But get in an accident and damage the frame and it's a complete write-off. And replace one of those skinny wagon wheel tires that only exist on i3s that have to come all the way from Germany and you're back to square one. So that's what Jazz has been struggling with. Which one should he get? And here's the answer. Most people go for the biggest battery to get the most range they can, to get as close to the usability of the gas cars they're used to. But back to Spencer's graph, the bigger the battery, the more CO2, right? So you want a smaller battery, but that means less range. Not on a motorcycle. The Zero's battery is half the size of a Nissan Leafs, but goes further on a charge because it's way lighter weight. So an electric motorcycle was the solution Jez was looking for the whole time. However, yes it can go further in relation to the size of its battery, but does that mean it's more efficient? The range might be better, but it's a fraction of the weight, so shouldn't the Zero be able to go way further? A big factor is the aerodynamics. Even though they're lighter, motorcycles can't compete with cars when it comes to coefficient of drag, especially when you have a naked motorcycle like a Zero. So your range on a motorcycle is already less than it could be, which is why some people have built custom dustbin fairings for their Zeros. It looks pretty weird, but it works. And the range problem gets worse when you factor in proper battery usage. We're going to branch off for a minute. Okay, you know how your cell phone freaks out when you get down to 20%? The little icon turns red and they're like, plug it in, what are you waiting for? Come on, do it. It's a similar deal with charging all the way to 100%. They don't want that either. I'll try to explain this the best I can from my basic understanding of how batteries work. So imagine this is the battery. I know it's a sandwich, but play along. So now this sandwich has jam in it because I hate peanut butter. And right now there's jam on both slices. It's a great sandwich. Think of this slice being how much energy you can potentially have in your battery, and the other slice being energy you can use. So right now you have 50% battery, right in the middle. When you plug the battery in, the remaining jam from this slice starts going over to the usable slice. Now you're fully charged up. When you use the battery, the jam goes back over. 
But for a healthy sandwich, you kind of want both slices to have an equal amount of jam. If you're at 20% or below, there isn't enough jam over here and the slice of bread starts to fall apart. Think of it like the jam is holding the sandwich together. It's the same deal when you're at 100%. There isn't enough jam over here and it starts to fall apart. To sum up, if you don't have enough jam on each slice of bread, it compromises the structural integrity of the sandwich. And that's how you get those open sandwiches you have to eat with a knife and fork. And nobody wants those. So for a healthy sandwich battery, you want to stay between 20 and 80%. It'll prolong the life of your battery, a lot longer than the manufacturer says. So if the company says your battery has 3,000 cycles, that's 3,000 full charges. And if a full charge gets you 100 miles, that's 300,000 miles that you can go before the battery starts degrading. But if you only charge between 20 and 80% in that Goldilocks zone, then the battery isn't as stressed. Your bread isn't falling apart. So even though you're only using 60% of your battery and only going like 60 miles instead of 100 miles, in the long run, you'll be able to do more cycles, so instead of going 300,000 miles, you might be able to go 400,000 miles. I didn't really do the math on that, it's just the idea that your battery will last a lot longer if you charge only between 20 and 80%. This is also why companies talk about their charge times to 80%. It's kind of half for battery health and half for speed, because it charges quickly up to 80 and then kind of ramps out to 100, so it slows down and does a lot of cell balancing things. But it's mostly about the health and prolonging your battery. But now this motorcycle you bought that could do 100 miles can only really do 60 if you care about the battery. Which sucks because they advertised it being able to do 100, but didn't tell you about the sandwich. The only way around living with a lower range is faster charging speed. So now Jez has an electric vehicle, his first. It's also a motorcycle with a smaller battery so it impacts the environment less. So really the DSR ticks a lot of boxes. And Zero recently announced that their 6 kilowatt charge tank was backwards compatible. So Jez got really excited that he could potentially solve that charging problem too. But I asked around and the only way to get a charge tank on your bike is to update the firmware so that the bike matches the charger and you can only do that at a dealer which we don't have so you can't do it. But we lucked out. Harlan at Hollywood Electrics had a set of 6.6 .6 kilowatt DigiNow chargers just lying around so we're picking up those along with some brand new charge tank plastics so it's going to look like a factory bike with a charger that's even faster than the Zero charger. Remember like two years ago when I went on that big ride, it was a, a range test using two of these DigiNow chargers and I managed to go over 500 Ks in a day. That's what this would be like, but with a proper zero looking tank on it. The DSR is about to be a road trip bike, so we're definitely making a video about it in the near future. Anyway, I hope this wasn't too overwhelming. Uh, for how simple electric motorcycles are, there's still a lot of stuff to think about. And it's important to think about this stuff for the sake of healthy sandwiches. Alright, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next year.